Hello and welcome to Libertarian Communist Platform. One of the most often referred to texts arguing against anarchism is On Authority by Friedrich Engels. Leninists who use this text to argue against the organised principle of self-management either don't know that this has already been debunked countless times by anarchists or are willfully ignorant of theory. I thought I would debunk it again to hopefully set the record straight as best I can. We're going to work through this point by point, so let's get started. A number of socialists have latterly launched a regular crusade against what they call the principle of authority. It suffices to tell them that this or that act is authoritarian for it to be condemned. This summary mode of procedure is being abused to such an extent that it has become necessary to look into the matter somewhat more closely. Authority, in the sense in which the word is used here, means the imposition of the will of another upon ours. On the other hand, authority presupposes subordination. Now, since these two words sound bad and the relationship which they represent is disagreeable to the subordinated party, the question is to ascertain whether there's any way of dispensing with it, whether, given the conditions of present-day society, we could not create another social system in which this authority would be given no scope any longer and would consequently have to disappear. On examining the economic, industrial and agricultural conditions which form the basis of present-day bourgeois society, we find that they tend more and more to replace isolated action by combined action of individuals. Modern industry, with its big factories and mills, where hundreds of workers supervise complicated machines driven by steam, has superseded the small workshops of the separate producers. The carriages and wagons of the highways have become substituted by railway trains, just as the small schooners and sailing felucas have been by steamboats. Even agriculture falls increasingly under the dominion of the machine and of steam, which slowly but relentlessly put in the place of the small proprietors, big capitalists, who, with the aid of hard workers, cultivate vast stretches of land. Everywhere, combined action, the complication of processes dependent upon each other, displaces independent action by individuals. But whoever mentions combined action speaks of organisation. Now, is it possible to have organisation without authority? Okay, so first of all, Engels appears to be conflating collective organisation with hierarchy. Anarchists see the freedom of all as the necessary premise and confirmation of the freedom of each. Mikhail Bakunin and Karl Marx, although they had a lot of disagreements, had a similar conception of what freedom is. They both held that a materialist conception of freedom is eminently social. In Man, Society and Freedom, Bakunin writes, Man completely realises his individual freedom, as well as his personality, only through the individuals who surround him, and thanks only to the labour and the collective power of society. Bakunin continues and says, Man becomes conscious of himself and his humanity only in society, and only by the collective action of the whole society. He frees himself from the yoke of external nature only by collective and social labour, which alone can transform the earth into an abode favourable to the development of humanity. The anarchist argument is that collective action, contrary to negating the freedom of the individual, actually helps human beings to develop. Anarchists are therefore not against collective organisation. Collective organisation is a necessary part of anarchism. It is absurd to suggest that just because there needs to be social coordination of industry, that therefore hierarchical authority is justified. Let's continue with Engels' writing. Supposing a social revolution dethroned the capitalists who currently exercise their authority over the production and circulation of wealth. Supposing, to adopt entirely the point of view of the anti-authoritarians, that the land and the instruments of labour had become the collective property of the workers who used them. Will authority have disappeared, or will it only have changed its form? Let us see. Let us take by way of example a cotton spinning mill. The cotton must pass through at least six successive operations before it is reduced to the state of thread, and these operations take place for the most part in different rooms. Furthermore, keeping the machines going requires an engineer to look after the steam engine, mechanics to make the current repairs, and many other labourers whose business it is to transfer the products from one room to another, and so forth. All these workers, men, women and children, are obliged to begin and finish their work at the hours fixed by the authority of the steam, which cares nothing for individual autonomy. 
The workers must, therefore, first come to an understanding on the hours of work, and these hours, once they are fixed, must be observed by all, without any exception. Thereafter, particular questions arise in each room, and at every moment, concerning the mode of production, distribution of material, etc., which must be settled by decision of a delegate placed at the head of each branch of labour, or, if possible, by a majority vote. The will of the single individual will always have to subordinate itself, which means that questions are settled in an authoritarian way. In calling this authoritarian, Engels is ignoring the materialist conception of freedom as it's more or less agreed upon by Marx and Bakunin. The automatic machinery of the big factory is much more despotic than the small capitalists who employ workers ever have been. At least with regard to the hours of work, one may write upon the portals of these factories, leave ye that enter in all autonomy behind. If man, by dint of his knowledge and inventive genius, has subdued the forces of nature, the latter avenge themselves upon him by subjecting him, insofar as he employs them, to a veritable despotism independent of all social organisation. Wanting to abolish authority in large-scale industry is tantamount to wanting to abolish industry itself, to destroy the power loom in order to return to the spinning wheel. This is embarrassing. It's embarrassing for a number of reasons. Firstly, let's tackle this idea that you need mechanics and engineers and all of that. Bakunin notes that the authority of expertise in a given area is distinct from hierarchical authority. Authority, understood in terms of expertise, does not limit liberty. For the same reason that, in the middle of this pandemic, I listen to the advice of doctors and nurses to stay at home. I don't waltz around saying, oh, you're asking me to wear a mask, that violates my liberty. Ra, 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 I want to exercise my right to get sick and die. Because getting sick and dying, or putting other people at risk, does not enhance my freedom at all. Hence, I defer to the authority of doctors and nurses. Or, to quote Bakunin, does it follow that I reject all authority, perish the thought, in the matter of boots, I defer to the authority of the bootmaker. Anarchism is therefore entirely compatible with the idea of deferring to someone who has skills and knowledge. The second objection is that in Bakunin's other theoretical writings, he argues that society should be organised from base to summit and from circumference to centre. In other words, society should be organised from the bottom up rather than the top down by means of free federation of the associated producers. Free federation of the associated producers is entirely compatible with delegation. In fact, anarchists are generally in favour of a system of democratically elected, instantly recallable delegates to collectively manage things like large-scale industry. Another alternative would be rotation, i.e. everyone gets a shot at being a delegate. The third objection is, in a communist society, we seek to abolish the division of labour, and that goes straight back to Marx. And if that's what we're setting out to do, certain things do need to be worked out. There would be a lot of boring admin that would need to be done under socialism, but it would be very important that said admin is not monopolised and made the reserve of an elite class which organises things in its own interests. So we need to share the administrative labour if the overall division of labour is something we wish to overcome. Not only does this idea go back to Marx, but also workers establishing cooperatives in Argentina, for example, have experienced alienation because of the division of labour in said cooperatives. So the division of labour needs to be overcome as part of the revolutionary process, and that's an important objection. Let's continue with Engels' 19th century equivalent of a galaxy brain take. Let us take another example, the railway. Here too, the cooperation of an infinite number of individuals is absolutely necessary, and this cooperation must be practiced during precisely fixed hours so that no accidents may happen. Here too, the first condition of the job is a dominant will that settles all subordinate questions. Whether this will is represented by a single delegate or a committee charged with the execution of the resolutions of the majority of persona interested. In either case, there is a very pronounced authority. Moreover, what would happen to the first train dispatched if the authority of the railway employees over the passengers were abolished? This is, again, a question of expertise which, as I've already stated, anarchists have no problem with. However, I want to offer a counterexample here, which is the historian of the Spanish Revolution Gaston Laval's work, Collectives in the Spanish Revolution. Now, in fairness to Engels, this revolution was long after he died. However, if the word praxis means anything, then we should learn from what we've experienced and adjust our theory accordingly. Laval gives a detailed analysis of how anarchists managed the transportation system in Spain. Now, because of the conditions given by the Civil War and the energy and resource demands of that, organisation of the transportation system was difficult, but they did manage it, including railways and tramways. 
When I submitted arguments like these to the most rabid anti-authoritarians, the only answer they were able to give me was the following. Yes, that's true, but there it is not the case of authority which we confer on our delegates, but of a commission entrusted. These gentlemen think that when they have changed the names of things, they have changed the things themselves. This is how these profound thinkers mock at the whole world. Giving the left libertarians a fair hearing would detract from the elaborate straw man that Engels is constructing here. Engels never explains what said left libertarians meant by a commission entrusted. Bear in mind this is 19th century so the language could have been different, or he may well be paraphrasing to suit his argument, which is probably the case, but in any case this renders analysis difficult if not on impossible. In which case, I refer you to the previous example of the railways and tramways given by Laval. We have thus seen that on the one hand, a certain authority, no matter how delegated, and on the other hand, a certain subordination, are things which, independently of all social organisation, are imposed upon us together with the material conditions under which we produce and make products circulate. This is, again, embarrassing, because he is again conflating organisation with hierarchy, and we know already that a consistent social anarchist has to be pro-horizontal organisation. It's not simply a kind of reckless, let's abandon all systems. Indeed, one experience I had as a demonstration was where I offered someone a free paper from AFED, and they said, it just sounds like another system. And yes, it is another system, a better system. Let us continue reading. We have seen, besides, that the material conditions of production and circulation inevitably develop with large-scale industry and large-scale agriculture and increasingly tend to enlarge the scope of this authority. Hence, it is absurd to speak of the principle of authority as being absolutely evil and of the principle of autonomy as being absolutely good. <sighs> Does it follow that I reject all authority? Perish the thought. I've already made this point, but just to drive it home, consider Tom Wetzel's on organisation. I'm not sure when it was written originally, but on the Anarchist Library it says it was retrieved in April 2017. So this appears to be quite recent, and Tom Wetzel had some criticisms to make of consensus, and he also talks about delegation from a libertarian communist perspective. Wetzel writes, It is possible to elect people to perform delegated tasks without creating a top-down organisation. Here are a few guidelines. The scope of authority of an elected person, such as correspondence secretary or treasurer, should be explicitly defined and delimited so that everyone knows what this person should be doing and with the requirement of regular reports to keep the membership informed. The person should be elected for a limited term, such as one year, and should be subject to recall at any time by majority vote of the membership, but with the requirement of adequate notice to ensure that this is not sprung all of a sudden by those members least favourable to the person currently doing the job. If at all feasible, there should be a requirement of mandatory rotation from office. This is especially important for any position of acting as spokesperson or representative of an organisation or body of people. If an organisation is very small, however, it is sometimes difficult to rotate responsibilities. Even so, the person carrying out responsibilities can report regularly to membership meetings and can thus be directed by decisions of the membership. Nobody is to be elected to set policy for the organisation, but only to carry out those responsibilities that have been assigned by the membership. The general membership meeting of the organisation must remain the supreme decision-making body and can overrule any decisions of elected officers. The idea is that the main decision-making responsibility of the organisation is not to be delegated to some steering committee or executive, but is conducted directly by the membership through their own discussions and votes. This is the heart of the libertarian concept of organisation. And I think this is a very reasonable set of proposals. Most social anarchists would probably agree with this. And this is not a new idea. This idea of democratically elected, instantly recallable delegates was implemented during, for example, the great upheaval of the late 1870s, wherein railroad workers in the United States organised strike action not through the mainstream trade unions, but by delegation. All of this is compatible with anarchism, and it's dishonest to suggest that it isn't. Let's continue reading. Authority and autonomy are relative things whose spheres vary with the various phases of the development of society. If the autonomists confine themselves to saying that the social organisation of the future would restrict authority solely to the limits within which the conditions of production render it inevitable, we could understand each other. But they are blind to all facts that make the thing necessary, and they passionately fight the world. 
This appears to be an economistic analysis. To paraphrase Justin Muller from the essay on anarchism and education, which I shared on my channel earlier, the core of anarchism is an underlying scepticism towards hierarchy, and therefore socialism is an incidental feature of anarchism, as is opposition to patriarchy, for example. I don't think Engels' argument holds here because authority, understood in the sense of hierarchy and domination, as a problem, is not confined only to the economic sphere, but also exists in many other areas of life, such as race, gender and sexuality. Why do the anti-authoritarians not confine themselves to crying out against political authority, the state? All socialists are agreed that the political state, and with it political authority, will disappear as a result of the coming social revolution. That is, that public functions will lose their political character and will be transformed into the simple administrative functions of watching over the true interests of society. The elaborate straw man of anarchism continues. The fact that anarchism is not limited to anti-statism, but is in fact more than anti-statism, is completely uncontroversial. This is just basic 101 stuff that Engels is missing. Anarchism comes from the Greek anarchos, meaning no rulers. This includes an opposition to capitalism, the patriarchal family structure, homophobia, transphobia, and so on. It is not merely limited to the state. Secondly, the points I made about getting rid of the division of labour also apply. That's necessary in the process of revolutionary change, otherwise there's a big risk of reproducing class relations. For example, having an elite class watching over the administrative functions of society. Finally, let's read the last of On Authority and be done with it. But the anti-authoritarians demand that the political state be abolished at one stroke, even before the social conditions that gave birth to it have been destroyed. They demand that the first act of the social revolution shall be the abolition of authority. Have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? This is not only ignorant, but offensively so. Consider, for example, the experience of Joseph de Jacques, the French anarcho-communist revolutionary and poet. He was organising for women's emancipation. Also, for his participation in the workers' uprising in Paris in June 1848, he had been imprisoned at Cherbourg and released in March 1849. Rearrested in June 1849 when the royalists came back to power, he continued to be in and out of trouble. Consider the experience of Bakunin, whose ideas we have been quoting. He was in prison for years for participating in an insurrection. Eugène Farlin was tortured and shot. And here we have factory owner Engels telling us, have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? Again, this is offensively ignorant of history. Let's continue. A revolution is certainly the most authoritarian thing there is. It is the act whereby one part of the population imposes its will upon the other part by means of rifles, bayonets and cannon. Authoritarian means, if such there be at all, and if the victorious party does not want to have fought in vain, it must maintain this rule by means of the terror which its arms inspire in the reactionists. This is, again, embarrassing. Engels is saying, Oh, you're anti-authoritarian, and yet you're in favour of revolution. Curious. Don't you think that's a kind of authority? This is reactionary. It's almost on the level of the reverse racism logic. The oppressed class using armed force to overthrow oppression and repress the capitalist class is in fact anti-authoritarian, and for Engels to argue otherwise is quite frankly a betrayal of socialist values. It is not the social revolution which is violent, but the institutions it seeks to abolish that are. Would the Paris Commune have lasted a single day if it had not made use of the authority of the armed people against the bourgeois? Should we not, on the contrary, reproach it for not having used it freely enough? Again, the same point applies. Anarchists consistently advocate armed insurrection. Engels leaves us with this. Therefore, either one of two things. Either the anti-authoritarians don't know what they're talking about, in which case they are creating nothing but confusion, or they do know, and in that case they are betraying the movement of the proletariat. In either case, they serve the reaction. So let's just sum up Engels' argument. He misses basic 101 stuff, such as the distinction between hierarchical authority and competent authority. He misses the point about delegation used to coordinate large-scale industry. And then he calls revolution authoritarian. Self-described socialists in the modern day who refer to Engels' on authority as if it were some kind of definitive proof that anarchism is unworkable are not only ignoring all of these things, they're not only ignoring the history of the libertarian wing of the socialist 
populist movement and not adjusting their theory accordingly, but also on authority is a brief train of thought. It's not a rigorous and systematic piece of literature like Capital, for example. Herein lies the obvious drawback of adopting a philosophy wherein you worship specific individuals and treat their words as gospel, no matter how logically flawed, offensively ignorant and reactionary they happen to be. Also, I want to say to any Marxist watching, just saying the words material conditions as if they are imbued with some kind of special power that magically absolves you of having to make a decent argument for your position is a cop-out. To me, citing on authority as if to say, back in your box anarchists, Engels disagrees with you, is in the same ballpark as that kind of thing. Just because Engels thinks X, that doesn't mean that X is true. The good thing about being an anarchist is that you don't have to worship an individual or group. When engaging with texts, you take what's true and disregard what's wrong. And by the way, just because I've quoted some of Bakunin's writings here, that doesn't mean that I agree with everything he says. Bakunin was an anti-Semite, for example. Obviously, anti-Semitism is absolutely condemnable, and I don't agree with Bakunin's anti-Semitic views. However, I do think that Bakunin was right, specifically concerning the materialist conception of freedom and his ideas about competent authority based on expertise. Other anarchists have written about these same topics since, but the reason why I quoted Bakunin was because Bakunin was of Engels' time, and so there's a need to place Engels in his historical context, and that's what I was trying to do there. But all the same, it is necessary to revise theory when revolutionary praxis proves it wrong, as it did during the Spanish Revolution. This has been Libertarian Communist Platform. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon.